October 1st edition of Sports Extra. It was a record-setting performance for Tar Heel football against the hopelessly outmatched Idaho Vandals. The women's soccer team drilled Miami in equally impressive fashion. And the volleyball team got out the brooms to send Georgia Tech back to Atlanta Humboldt. All that, and you'll meet a Carolina student who's a champion at juggling a soccer ball. Sports Extra starts right now. From the University of North Carolina School of Journalism and Mass Communication, covering the full range of Tar Heel athletics, this is Sports Extra. Hello and welcome to Sports Extra, UNC's only sports highlights, analysis, and commentary show. I'm Will Reimer. I'm Sefia Mokwai. It was a great weekend to be a Tar Heel. And I'm Natalia Perez. Thanks for joining us. And we'll begin with football. It was a historic day for the Tar Heels against the Idaho Vandals Saturday. Sports Extra reporter Mike Rodriguez braved two tornado warnings, camera malfunctions, and a lot of rain to get you the action. A few fans braved the weather as they watched the Heels pour it on in a 66 to nothing victory against the Idaho Vandals on Military Appreciation Day. The Tar Heels scored fast and often, including a 32-yard flea flicker that fooled even me less than three minutes into the game. Junior quarterback Bryn Renner threw three touchdowns before he was pulled early in the third quarter after the team was up 45 to nothing. Redshirt freshman quarterback Marquise Williams threw for a touchdown and ran for two more in his relief effort for Renner. Head coach Larry Fedora says he was happy to give the underclassmen an opportunity to play. Every rep that those younger guys get, the better we're going to be as a football team. Freshman wideout Quinn Sean Davis led the team with four receptions for 89 yards and two touchdowns. Renner says he trusted his receivers despite the sloppy conditions. All of our receivers have great hands, so I, I trust them with, with my full confidence that uh, they can get the job done and they're going to catch the ball. So Sophomore tailback Giovanni Bernard had only two rushes, but made them count, running for 70 yards and two touchdowns. The Heels were able to spread the ball around. Six players scored eight touchdowns. Renner says that's a goal of the offense. Absolutely, you know, um, we have guys working hard every week to get on the field and, and to make plays like that, and they deserve um, everything they get on Saturday. And, uh, you know, six guys scoring touchdowns is what we're about as an offense, you know, getting guys involved, um, just giving the ball to other people and, uh, and really making plays. The defense shut out the Vandals and has yet to allow a touchdown in three home games this season. The Heels allowed fewer than 200 total yards and forced five turnovers. Cornerback Trey Boston says the guys on defense know they haven't allowed a touchdown at home and want to keep it that way. And when we came back to the tar pit, we knew that this is our house. Uh, we have to protect it, and we haven't let anybody score. So with that, it gives us a great amount of pride. Special teams even got into the act. Running back Romar Morris and linebacker Pete Mangum each blocked a punt in the first quarter. It was a complete team victory. In Chapel Hill, I'm Mike Rodriguez, Sports Extra. Carolina improved a 3-2 and two on the season with the victory. Though the whole game resembled one big highlight reel for UNC, there was one key play for the Heels. UNC's lead was just 7 to nothing, with the Heels in the red zone again. Then what looked like an Eric Ebron first down turned scary when the ball popped out of his hands. Luckily, his teammates had his back. The ball fell into the end zone, and Eric Highsmith dived on, dived on it for the touchdown. If Idaho picked up the fumble, the Vandals would have had the ball with a chance to tie. Instead, it's a UNC score, and the rest just looked like a party for the Heels. You know, guys, it could have been a different ball game if Highsmith hadn't recovered the, the fumble. Um, if, the, if the Vandals had recovered it, that could have given them the momentum they needed to really pick up the ball, drive the field, and score. The way our defense was playing, I don't know if Idaho would have been able to move the ball even if they had recovered it. But you're right, things would have been different if Highsmith hadn't landed on that ball. And, well, it's a good thing Highsmith did grab the ball for a touchdown, so we'll never have to find out if the game would have gone any differently. In a record-setting day for the UNC offense, many players chipped in for the impressive 66-point performance. Walk-ons Kenny Owens and Caleb Presley even got into the action. But no one was more impressive than freshman wide receiver Quinshawn Davis. Davis had four receptions for a career-high 89 yards and two touchdowns. His 22.9 yard per reception average was an exclamation point to the Tar Heel victory, making him this week's recipient of our offensive game ball. He would have had three touchdowns, but this pass from Renner right here was prevented by this pass interference, and his touchdowns were the first and second of his Tar Heel career. This is the first time Davis has won the award. Many players could have won this award this week. That offense was firing on all cylinders. It sure was, and it seems there's getting, they're getting comfortable with the pacing. The longest drive Saturday was 13 plays, and it lasted four minutes. Right, Sefe, but that, but that drive came in the third quarter when most of the first stringers were out of the game. Renner's longest drive was just nine plays, and it only took three minutes. 
Saturday shutout was also an outstanding group of effort by the defense, and senior leadership was big. Senior defense tackle Sylvester Williams helps lead the shutout of the Vandals with two solo tackles and two assists, making him this week's winner of our defensive game ball. What was most impressive, however, was his ability to penetrate the line of scrimmage as he led the team with 2.5 tackles for loss. Williams' hard work helped the Tar, Heels, Tar Heel defense limit Idaho to less than 100 net yards rushing and zero touchdowns on the ground. Williams also got to, got to what every defensive tackle loves most, sacking the quarterback. He accounted for the only sack of the day for either team. This is Sylvester Williams' first time winning our defensive game ball. This award also could have gone to a few players. Everyone on the defense was getting involved. That's true, but Williams certainly stood out. He put a lot of pressure on Idaho quarterback Dominique Blackman. Honestly, I don't care who won the award. I just want our defense to show up next week against the Hokies and for the rest of the season. And the offensive line had a great game too, opening up holes for running backs and not allowing a single sack. Jonathan Cooper earns this week's award for the offensive lineman of the game. You see his number 64 right there. His coaches graded him at 91%, and the senior guard also had 10 knockdown blocks. Cooper's projected to be a late first-round pick in next year's NFL draft, and this is Cooper's second time winning the award. And you've probably heard that Carolina's total points and margin of victory are new school records. But you might not have heard what made the defense's performance so special. It's time for our hidden stat of the week. The Tar Heels 66-0 win against Idaho marks the first time UNC has had two students, two shutouts in the same season since 1996. The outstanding defense effort by the Heels limited Idaho to only 189 yards of total offense. In fact, Idaho's offense never entered red zone territory. Much of the Tar Heels defensive success can be attributed to its third down defense, holding Idaho to four of 17 on third down conversions. And after the break, we'll update you about the other Tar Heel teams. Including the women's soccer team, which unleashed a storm on the hurricane Sunday. So, same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. My life is full of statistics. Thing is, I could have dropped out of school and become one myself, but I didn't because I had people that believed in me. Here's another statistic. 7,000 students drop out every school day. That's one every 26 seconds. It's time that students know that we believe in them. Inspire a student and share your message of support at boostup.org. So, I got this new family, and I don't know what it is about this one, but she can't seem to put down that toy all day long. Tap, 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 tap. Oh, and she even talks to it. She talks to that more than she talks to him. What's up, bro? Nice shirt. Who's she talking to? Her mom? She talks to her mom a lot. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to Energy Star light bulbs, and you'll realize just how much cash you are really burning through. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Sunday. Julian Caldwell joins us live in studio. Did the Heels prove there's no storm they can't overcome? <laughs> Will, you could uh, definitely say that. After a heartbreaking loss against number one FSU Thursday, the Heels had an offensive outburst, dominating the Canes 6-1. to one. Let's take a look at the Heels' big afternoon. After 90 minutes without a goal against the Seminoles, the Heels had to wait only six minutes, yes, just six minutes, before their first goal by junior forward Kalia Ojai. 
And just two minutes later, the scoring provides continued when senior midfielder Amber Brooks scored a header on a corner kick from teammate Renee Premji. And the Heels take a 2-0 lead. With the comfortable lead heading into halftime, Coach Dorrance wasn't ready to ease up on the pressure the Tar Heels were placing on the Canes. Uh, we play a very aggressive, uh, high-pressure, sprinting style. I think that wore them out a bit, so I thought it was a stretch in the middle of the second half where I think they were just tuckered out. Once Miami ran out of energy toward the end of the second half, Carolina proceeded to pile on the goals, scoring three times in just five minutes. After Premzi kicked off the party with an assisted goal, you see Katie Bowen score from the top of the box in the upper right corner of the goal. And here you see Maria Lugrano score on a tough angle to the far post. On the last goal of the Heels' blowout victory, Christine Welsh Loveman assisted a Paige Nielsen goal, both players coming off the bench. Now you couldn't see the pass in that shot, but you can see here UNC thrilled with a 6-1 win, and Coach Dorrance was just as happy with his bench. In general, uh, I'm very happy with my reserve players. Uh, They've all got you know, some pieces missing, they all lack some experience, but I think uh, they're the kind of players in two or three years that people are going to look at and say, oh my gosh, that's a, that's a significant player. And it was a real team effort for the Heels yesterday, Will. Thirteen different Heels had at least one shot in the game. Nobody had more than one goal. Nobody had more than one assist, so a perfect balance. But they were missing an important part of their team, weren't they? Yeah, um, they were, Will. Uh, freshman Summer Green is away until mid-October playing in the U-17 Women's World Cup. She has five goals in just five games for the Heels, so with her, we can only imagine what the score would have been. We'll certainly be, able, be eager to see how dangerous the team is when she returns. That was Julian Caldwell, live in studio. Thanks, Julian. And the men's soccer team played a lot this week. The Heels beat Wofford 1-0 Tuesday in, in overtime and faced Duke Friday. Duke was up 1-0 with just minutes left despite being down to nine men for the last 10 minutes of the game. Cameron Bounds scored in the 87th minute and it sent, the, it sent the game into overtime. And with just two minutes left in overtime, Jordan Gaffa netted the game winner. Carolina is undefeated in its past seven games, winning six of them. The, Heel, the Heels play Georgia, at, Georgia Southern excuse me, at 7 p.m. tomorrow at Fetzer Field. And field hockey had two wins this weekend. The Heels beat ranked ACC opponent Wake Forest 3-2 Saturday and then smoked VCU 6-1 Sunday. Carolina's fiery offense outshot both teams. The Heels took 23 shots against number 15 Demon Deacons with goals from Charlotte Craddock, Katie Ardry, and Emma Bowzik. It was senior Kelsey Cole Jacek who really stood out Sunday with three of the six goals against VCU. Charlotte Craddock, Shanae Loren, and Marta Malmberg also scored. UNC is now 12-1 this season and undefeated in conference play. The Heels will have a break for the rest of the week before taking on Boston College Saturday and Dartmouth Sunday. The volleyball team won both of its matches this week. The Heels beat Clemson Wednesday and Georgia Tech yesterday. Kara Palmer joins us live in the studio. Kara, two wins at home for the Heels isn't new, is it? No, it's not, Sefe. The Heels are actually undefeated at home and 4-1 and won the ACC. And they got their first sweep of the season yesterday. On Sunday, the Tar Heels downed the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets at Carmichael Arena. <laughs> In the 3-0 win, the Tar Heels improved to 13-2 on the season thanks to senior Emily McGee's 11 kills and sophomore EJ Tanaz's 15 digs. The first set was a defensive battle for the Tar Heels. Although the Heels led most of the first set, with set point, they allowed the Yellow Jackets to rally back and tie at 24. That's when they did what their coach was hoping they would do. We just said, you know, go back to what we were doing, um, really be focused. One of our key words for this match was to be composed in tight situations. And I think we were. And he had reason to as UNC won the set 29 to 27. By Coach Segubo's design, things got a lot easier for the Hills. After that game, I told our team we need to go back and stay disciplined and be focused on staying with our simple plan and not try to do some things outside of it. And the answer to Coach's call was one word. Seniors. You would hope and you, you, you want your seniors to make the clutch plays at the end of the games because they have the most experience. And you need to go to your seniors to come up with your big plays. Senior Emily McGee did the bulk of her work in the last two sets with four kills in each one. UNC handled the final two sets, trailing for only one play for the rest of the match. Carolina closed the game with a 25-19 final set win. Well, the Hills are undefeated at home and 5-2 and two on the road. Now, that record won't be very important. Well, excuse me, will be very important this week because Carolina won't play in Carmichael until October 19th when they play Florida State and Miami this week. Now, the Hills are tied with those two teams for second place in the conference at 4-1. and one. And how do you think Carolina will do in Florida this week? 
Well, Coach Gould did say yesterday that the Hills just need to stick to the game and stick with each other. They can do that. I think they'll do just fine. Well, we hope it can come back to Chapel Hill with two wins. Thanks, Kara. That was Kara Palmer live in the studio. And can you juggle a soccer ball? Probably not as well as this Tar Heel. We don't win unless we work together. It's how we play our best. It's how we survive on the field. Now that same teamwork can save 13 million people affected by the famine, war, and drought in the Horn of Africa. Go to this site and forward the facts to everyone you know. The more people who know, the more money we can raise. And the more money we raise, the more people we can help. Because saving lives doesn't take a lot. It just takes a lot of us. It could cost you around $10,000. You'll face major legal fees, major fines, and steep insurance penalties. You could lose everything. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. expert about the options that are right for you. Real help, real answers, right now. Graduating from Carolina can be a challenge. Now, Dr. Richard Southall says the challenge can be even greater for student athletes. And journalism professor, uh, journalism professor Dr. Charlie Tuggle sat down with Southall to discuss why some athletes aren't graduating with their peers. So you're comparing full-time students who are athletes to full-time students who are not athletes. That's right. That's right, and that's, a, that's a, a legitimate comparison that we want to make because our athletes being fully integrated and we know that if athletes are more integrated into the student population, their graduation rates go up. So we have two sports, excuse me, three sports that have significant gaps. Baseball, men's basketball, and football. Softball has very little, if any, gap. Women's basketball has much less of a gap than the other sports. So we have three sports that seem to have more and larger gaps. And those are the three revenue producing sports in our country, baseball, basketball, and football. And specifically to college sport, football is the largest revenue generating sport, men's basketball being second. But baseball, which many people talk about being a better model where athletes can leave after three years, well, if baseball players leave after three years, they still don't graduate. Mm -hmm. So if, if it is an educational enterprise, then it's legitimate to compare full-time students who make up the majority of most college campuses to full-time athletes. We're looking at your numbers, and your numbers show that the ACC has the second worst differential. Or largest, I wouldn't largest, say worst, it's just largest. Largest differential and adjusted graduation gap. Uh, and we already know that it compares uh, athletes who are full-time students to other full-time students. The ACC is not a football conference. Right. So why is the ACC but, so high in that well, graduation I, gap? I think one of the factors is uh, what type of institutions 
make up the ACC, as well as the PAC-12, which has the largest gap. There's some very rigorous academic institutions uh, that it's hard to graduate. You know, you have to work to graduate and to get in to uh, these academic institutions. So it's not surprising that you would have a gap uh, because also, the other thing that many of our universities in the ACC do not have large part-time student populations. M many of our students, regular students, might be working a part-time job, but not very many of them are working a 50 to 60 hour rigorous, physically demanding job, which is really what college football is. To see the full interview with Dr. Southall, visit carolinaweek.org. And we're all well aware of the, of the successes of Carolina's women's soccer team, but you might not know that one player has had her big, biggest success off the field. Reporter Brenna Sukier joins us live in the studio to tell us more. That's right, Natalia. I spoke to freshman soccer player Indy Cowie, who's the current world freestyle champion. And let me tell you, Natalia, that's no small feat. In fact, it requires a lot of talent with your feet. Can you do this? What about this? Or maybe this? Freshman soccer player Indy Cowie can, and that's why she's the 2012 World FIFA Street vs. Street Freestyle Champion. I got into freestyle when I was probably like 11 or 12 years old. I went over to England for a Brazilian soccer school training, um, and I met John Farmworth, and he was the world champion at freestyle at the time. Um, and so I saw a little performance that he did, and I just knew from that day on that that's what I wanted to do. Cowie was hand chosen as champion by Argentinian soccer player Leo Messi, and she has many hours of practice to thank. It's every day I try and do like an hour and a half, or just, you know, whenever I have time, just, you know, go for out and freestyle and fit it in, but I just love doing it. But finding time to fit in practice can be difficult, especially when Cowie has more than just a ball to juggle. I have a lot of stuff going on, you know, soccer in school and, you know, freestyle. It just it can be hard to fit everything in, but, you know, I love it all. And Cowie also loves being at UNC. I love UNC. Um, I've wanted to go here. This is my dream. So I get to, you know, wake up every day and live my dream. I love it. But Cowie also has dreams for her freestyling. Just continue to see where I can go with the sport and, you know, see what tricks I can get. Cowie clearly has a good bag of tricks, but I was curious to see if she could teach me any. So Indy's here and she's going to teach me a little bit of freestyling. So we'll see how this goes. Okay, so I'm going to teach you a next doll. So what you're going to do is you're going to put your feet shoulder width apart and make sure your knees are kind of bent, but not too much. And then you're going to put your back all the way over. And then the ball's going to sit right there at your neck. Okay. And then put your arms up in kind of like chicken wings so it's like okay. a balance. And then you got it. And then you can take it and flick off or let it roll down your back and kick it up. Or, there you go. And Cowie's advice for any other new freestylers? Practice, practice, practice. Never give up. Um, you know, it's tough sometimes. You get discouraged, but you just got to keep pushing through. Although I definitely need a bit of practice, it's clear that Cowie is on the ball. So as you can see, Natalia, Cowie has some pretty fancy footwork there, and I clearly do not. But in all seriousness, she truly is incredible. I could hardly believe my eyes, and it was happening right in front of me. We see what you mean, Brenna. And Cowie is doing all of that while recovering from an injury, right? That's right, Natalia. Cowie tore her ACL this summer, but she's well on the mend. It looks like she should be fully recovered any day now. Well, it's great to see that she kept the ball rolling. That's Brenna Sukier, live in the studio. And it's a busy week ahead for the Tar Heel teams. Here's a look at all of the action. On Tuesday, men's soccer plays at Fetzer Field against, the, uh, against Georgia Southern Eagles at 7 p.m. Thursday, women's soccer plays Boston College at home in an ACC matchup that airs live on ESPN3. Kickoffs at 8 p.m. On Friday, Tar Heel sports hit the road as the volleyball team travels to Tallahassee to play Florida State. The men's soccer team will travel to Clemson. Kickoff is at 7 p.m. and the match will be live on ESPN3. At 12.30 on Saturday, the Tar Heels will play Virginia Tech in Keenan Stadium as the student body attempts the first ever whiteout in school history. At 1 p.m., the women's field hockey team takes on Boston College in Massachusetts. The field hockey team will stay in Massachusetts to face Dartmouth at noon Sunday. And the volleyball team will also be far from home Sunday, playing Miami in Coral Gables at 1 p.m. And when we come back, we'll tell you if we think the Heels will be Virginia Tech this weekend. Two outs with a runner on first base. 
Now the big guy comes up with that, hitting 342 with 92 RBIs and 36 home runs. Chill raw and prepared foods promptly. One in six Americans will get sick from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. Millions of people are affected by disaster in America. And we're right there, providing food. With more than 200 food banks, reaching communities all across America. Donate now for immediate relief and long-term recovery. Every dollar helps provide food for disaster victims. Help now at feedingamerica.org. Brush, brushy, brush, brushy, brush, 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 brush. And people play football outside of Keenan Stadium, too. It's playoff time in intramurals. Players lace up their shoes, they warm up their throwing arms, and they take the field to play the great American sport. Football. Flag football. It's intramural season in Chapel Hill. Until October 16th, students from across campus will compete on hooker fields. These games are official, with penalties, scorekeepers, and three referees. These games can sometimes even get up close and personal. Sometimes too close and a little bit too personal. But students will do whatever it takes. There you have it right there. A little too close and personal. And students will do whatever it takes to win a championship t-shirt. If Carolina is going to beat Virginia Tech this weekend for just the second time since Hokies joined the ACC, its three-headed rushing attack will have to step up. Virginia Tech ranks just 75th in the nation in rush defense, which should mean a big day for Giovanni Bernard, A.J. Blue, and Romar Morris. The Hokies gave up, gave up, gave up 168 yards per game on the ground. Excuse me. Morris, Blue, and Bernard all have more than 200 yards rushing this season, and all three are averaging more than five yards per carry. The Hokie, but the Hokies Hokies have given up only four rushing touchdowns in five games. Something's going to have to give. Carolina has 12 rushing touchdowns on the season, and Bernard has scored at least once in every game he's played. And well, guys, it's time for us to make our predictions for this weekend's football game. Sefe, why don't you start us off? Well, it, I, both teams are 3-2, and two, and I think it's going to come down to which team wants it more. Virginia Tech's defense really let it slip this last few uh, seconds of the game Cincinnati last week, and I don't know if there's a word in the dictionary to describe what Carolina did to Idaho this weekend. There, there probably is some words, but we just can't say them on here. <laughs> well, with all of that, I'm going to have to go with the heels over the Hokies by a score of 24-21. to 21. Steph is right. Hokies, schmokies. They're coming to the heels' house, and they will lose. Both teams have, en have endured disappointing losses this season, but if Carolina's defense can continue to bring the pressure and the offense runs with the momentum from the massacre that was the Idaho game, then I think we'll see a 20-12 Carolina victory. And you know, guys, I was trying to think of some reasons to pick Virginia Tech for the sake of balance, but the Hokies got creamed away from home by Pittsburgh, which lost to Youngstown State. Youngstown State. And you know what? Logan Thomas has six interceptions this year, and I'll bet he'll throw a couple more this weekend. That's why I think Carolina's going to win 28-17. And so we all agree Carolina's going to win, and we'll find out next Monday if we're right. And, to, and finally, to conclude this edition of Sports Extra, here's this week's extra point. Quite literally, the extra point. Against Idaho, that is. Not only did the Tar Heels set a school scoring record with a 66-point margin of victory, but kicker Casey Barth now holds another personal record as well. He helped lead the victory with a total of nine extra points and a field goal, breaking Carolina's record for the number of extra points in one game. And the old record of eight extra points in a game dated back to 1898. That's 114 years ago. Was Dr. T the kicker at that time? <laughs> he might have been. <laughs> might have been. <laughs> well, that does it for this edition of Sports Extra. We hope to see you next week to talk more about Carolina, Carolina sports, which we all love so much. Anybody going to game tickets? Thanks for watching, everyone. Good night.